Okay. Yeah, got it. Here we go. Okay, hello everyone from Berlin. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, sorry, this is kind of all Zoom again. Um, Reminds us pretty much of Corona, but um, at least it gives us a chance and I'm happy to share the work um, I've done over the last 20 something years. Um, my background, I started off studying in Dublin in Ireland and then I moved to London where I did Chelsea College of Art and then at some point I also did the Cooper Union. So I used to live in the States um, and then end of the 90s I moved to Berlin and that's where I'm based, that's where I live and work. So here's my studio. But um, the studio functions more like, I don't know, almost like an office. I make models, I make, you know, small scale works. And most of the pieces I really kind of do on site, whatever, galleries, museums, and so on and so forth. So what I did is like a survey of the works. It's a lot of images. And I'm just gonna, you know, instead of talking about one image for hours on end, I thought I'll show you like a lot of work, um, different techniques, different approaches. So you get like a thread and idea kind of what kind of works I've done all over the years. You also are welcome to, to stop at some point if you have a question. I'm open if this is like, you know, it's just like a conversation and, you know, all easy, yeah? So let me share my screen. And then, um, hold on. Okay, here we go. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. And of course, it doesn't work. No. Then what I will have to do is I have to add the navigator. Does this work? Can you see it? Yeah, that's working. Okay, that's a very early piece. Um, it's titled Ecke Homo after Nietzsche. And what I did, I casted my mouth saying all the letters E, C, C, E, H, O, M, O. And I inserted speakers on top. So it was, you know, a mixture between audio and sculpture. They're my body height and the mouth. This is my early work after I, I graduated, yeah. But it's combining also like text. And um, I also started like an interest into Samuel Beckett at the time. So I still continued like being interested in the figure. So I casted the figure and placed it between two boxes. I have a trolley. So it's suggesting movement, whereas like, you know, the Egyptian archaic movement, the legs are not there. So it's already this interest in the moving figure in space, overcoming the static notion of it. I then placed it on a circular track. So it was like a, like a continuous movement back backwards in space. And I also attached a car battery. So, you know, it's kind of declining and turning into a standstill. Because I wasn't able to continuously, you know, build these large pieces and I didn't have the space, I started making these sketches and drawings. They're like printouts, um, color copies, also like on acetate. And I started, you know, collaging and choreographing, so to speak, the figure in space. So here I would have two, three circles, also like this dialogue then occurring. Afterwards, I started my very first video piece because I kind of got tired making the sculpture and the cast mode making as a sculpture is a wonderful process. But I thought it kind of, it bored me after a while because there's this perfection to it and you know it's too much like a mannequin or something so i decided to shift into video and i made a big mistake then at the time just i turned the camera on the side
there's twice the same sequence played at random. And the audio is important because you have the thinning of the head. Here I stacked it up. But this was the very first attempt into like a video piece. And as you can see here, you know, stacking boxes, it has still like this cultural approach to it and this interest. What I also did is I was placing when we were filming two sheets of paper on the wall. So wherever the, her forehead or the back of the head would touch the wall, she would leave this grease mark, what you would find on a bus or like on some sort of window. So I placed the grease marks at her body height at one meter 65. Yeah, and then I also have the video piece along. This one was the very wall, very simple setup, like that's the prop for the video. But that kind of interested me, so I got these huge sheets of MDF wood. I cut one in half and just arranged them as a performance device or like a device you could project on. Here, I build a double space for the exact fold forwards. That means like if I stand upright in the space and I fall forwards. So I have to, the height of my body. And if I fall over, I need the length of my shoes. So I had this manufactured by some company who would do the air conditioning. And it's this galvanized metal, right? Made a, a draft. So it would go like 360 degrees, like a continuous. And from that, this architectural device or the sculpture, I approached a dance company and I worked with two dancers. And I really filmed the fall. So I continued what I had before, the tilt between the space, but now have a 90 degree angle. It's a loop. This is Wilhelm Lehmbruck. The Fallen, which is a sculpture as a reference. And I filmed it also from underneath. So I'm shifting the, perspe the perspective of the figure, like the viewer. That's a position you're in that you never experience, right? To, to, to see the fall from the moment. which enables me to shift the figure in space the way I want it. I can have it upside down, or I created this passage. Again, this corner, like this is corrugated card. Here's a study, Lehmbruck and the dancer. This, this pose when he's getting up, just as a reference to an actual sculpture. And this is a draft called Ole Bonjour. It's like Happy Days from Samuel Beckett, where I would have like a triple projection. I never realized it, but it exists as a drawing and as a study. I started building my first fake concrete walls. It's a curved series, so this is more like a marquette. Or I made a marquette so you can actually walk onto it and have this double. projection so the fall will kind of leap towards you while you stand on it. So it's shifting the figure in space, completely breaking with the conventional, using video just as a tool, like for it. It's tricky and difficult and complicated. I don't really like it, um, but it became the instrument I use like most. Here I was invited in a museum it's a Frank Geary building and we reconstructed um, the walls 
from the given museum as projection surfaces. So instead of straight, uh, fake concrete walls, I had these ones built and I projected the sequence onto it. So the architecture and the space in conjunction and dialogue where the figure is in space or the viewer um, was this next work that I started because of Sasha Wald's the company, the first dancers. I happened to meet um, William Forsyth, the choreographer. So this was the prop, the setting um, in their rehearsal space. There are tables, which are kind of just turned on the side and then stacked up. So I would have a camera from above, have a camera from the front and one shooting here from the side. Just a really conventional 3D approach to figure the, like, uh, to, to film the figure in space. At the same time, it was just a prop for the film, but I like it as a sculpture. I really, really do. So I asked Forsyth, um, this is the final piece you can see here. The title is Whenever On On or Know How On. It's after Beckett's worst word poem. So instead of writing the actual letters like W, H, O, and so on, he's using his whole body to inscribe it in space. So like you saw already, I filmed him from the front, the side and above. And I attached two hand cameras, one face in the space, and the other one, and the other one facing towards the body. Here we go. That's the setup at the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt. Here you see the hand camera. Oh, that's Chicago, the Renaissance Society. Um, that's the hand camera. That's the perspective from the front and the perspective from above. So I have this five channel piece and all sequences run synchronized, okay? And here you can watch an extract from it. You are removed to them. And you can collage all the different sequences together. So at the time, there was no performance, I think really like much around. And for some reason, I just happened to, to work in the field of dance and choreography and show this within a museum. So that was kind of, you know, something new. And I was very lucky. So what I did then is I took the bird's perspective and put it onto, projected onto a piece of paper and started tracing the movement of foresight hands. So I was directed what to draw. Quite often using my left hand, like here in this video. Up. And then I ended up with these kind of organic abstract drawings. in this kind of strange shape. Here you see more. Um, the right hand is black and the left hand is red. 
and this will become a crucial piece later on. So I got these stills and I made these studies on top, chasing the movement. Hold on. And then I decided to take an extract here from the drawing, like this one here. Attached it into an architectural device. So the movement was generating an architecture for me like to project onto. And I play back the same sequence. Here it's like more like a Marquette. And this was in New York at the kitchen where we built it in large. There we go. So it's this architecture within a room within a room that you could move in between, which was generated by the movement, which I'm also playing back. So you can see there's all this doubling occurring. From these drawings, which I outlined earlier on, where this piece derived from, where it took like an extract, I came across Francis Bacon, and that's his studio in Kensington. Francis Bacon died in Madrid in 1992, and that's how his studio was back, was left like back in London like that. He started a canvas. He always used the raw canvas to avoid correction. He would directly go onto it. They're quite large. His studio was a total mess. So you can see like here, like on the walls, everywhere. They moved the whole studio and preserved it. And you can see it at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. There you also see part of the studio. But this study I already showed you, like you can see the correlation between the Francis Bacon and what I've done with Forsyth. Here you have like a second red figure. This is George Dyer. The circle is like the bin lid from the studio. So I started to make these studies and I asked Forsyth, this is the second red figure in, in, the, in the painting. So I asked Forsyth to reverse conceptually the first piece that we've done. And I asked him to translate the Francis Bacon painting into movement. So you see it here, we've got the Francis Bacon and this is the perspective filmed um, from the front, front above and the side. This is the National Gallery in Rome. Here I have a study where you kind of see, nope, working. Yeah. And I attached lead to his hands and feet and placed him on large sheets of paper. So while he's inscribing that figure in space, he would generate a new drawing on the paper, unawarely. This one here, you see the sequence from above. I don't know how he translated it. I find it fascinating, but he made this perfect circle. That's part of the unfinished portrait by Francis Reagan. Um, there are more drawings. Um, let me see. So like I said here, it's a similar concept. Um, filming the figure, the moving figure in space from the front, the side and above and playing this out simultaneously in space. And here at the Museum de Louvre in, London, in Paris, they took out all the ancient sculptures where, where movement is always suggested, but never occurring. 
So we replaced this with a choreographer inscribing the figure in space, right? Using Francis Bacon as a template. There's also drawings by, but that's too much. Another one afterwards, I went into a theater using this huge rotating stage to follow up this notion of the inscription inscribing, the figure inscribing the circle. So here I have these projection screens leaning towards each other, turning like into a freestanding sculpture. And again, I reverse the figure upside down on the side. So it's kind of like a drawing in space all over. Here again, you see installation shots. Here, spread it out six times. Again, I made these models, these marquettes, working with a reflection using a mirror. Partly have it on the wall. And then I made this one here, which is like a T. Junction. And I also inserted a mirror. So, what happened? Half of the figure got projected at the back of the space. So, I started to make these photo collages how I can arrange the figure in space. Always thinking, you know. These kinds of drawings, circular drawings, the body would inscribe in a space all over. And here I projected it onto neon tubes. The movement sensor. So when it came too close, it would kill, it would completely destroy the image. So after all these works with the choreographer, I kind of wanted to move on and um, try something different. And I found after I've done the unfinished portrait with Francis Bacon, I found this house in Italy. It's called Casa Malaparte. It's by writer Curzo Malaparte. That's him on the roof with his bicycle. And these are postcards. The first once this is about 1937. So here you see the house being built on this rock. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's unbelievable. Just slightly later. Here you have an idea. And I was so fascinated by this idea, how far like someone would go to build something like that at the time. And the interesting part is the house is a portrait. So after the self-portrait, the unfinished portrait of Francis Bacon, I found this house. It's a house like me, Casa Carme, glum, stale, and rigorous. The weather conditions can be harsh. And I'm sure some of you seen the movie um, by Jolie Godard, The Contempt, Le Meutri, with Brigitte Bardot. You have it here. But then I erased her. And I started, I went there like several times and I stayed there. I was allowed to film. And that was one sequence from the roof, which has this Mark Rothko approach. But taking the lens and going in and out of focus.
Another set of sequences I filled was the window. They're like, like a frame of a painting. That was his intention. They're made out of um, horse chestnut wood. And there's like these four big windows. Very kind of, you know, present in the film by Sholik Koda. And nothing happens. You just see the seagulls, you hear the sea, the water, and nothing else happens. Um, the way I installed them, that was an exhibition here in Berlin and a gallery that I did is that I used these projection screens, these back projection screens and kept some of the frames empty. So installing them like kind of in a modernistic kind of approach. And then just having these windows. So it's deplacing Malaparte to Berlin or vice versa. These are um, different models. Or here again, I built these fake concrete walls in the gallery space and had two sequences running at the same time. So this was the second portrait. The unfinished portrait by Francis Bacon was the first Casa Malaparte, which is this architectural icon, um, was the second portrait. And then I came across by chance this filmmaker, Antonioni, Michelangelo Antonioni. Here you see Monica Vizzi, and it's an outtake from the film The Red Desert, Deserto Rosso. It's quite tragic because it was the end of their relationship and he's forcing her like to, you know, in complete vulnerability, like to, to cry. It's an outtake, it never occurred in the film, which would have changed the whole outcome of the movie. And he walks into the scene once in a while and corrects her. So it's found footage and it was quite a relief, like something I didn't film myself or video or whatever. Oh, there you go. You see him walking in. Maybe some of you have seen the movie, The Red Desert. If not, I really recommend it to you. Antonioni and Mark Rothko, they were really close as well. And if you watch the film, there are some sequences. Um, you see there's a certain correlation. And in this exhibition, I decided to go slow, uh, small, instead of having large projections, make more like these sculptures using the projector as a sculpture, just having a tiny screen or a slight projector. But also went large. This is a cinema here in Berlin. I used um, a screen test, which I slowed down so you hardly see the movement at all. Or I projected it onto the cinema curtain, which would open then up and the film would actually start. It's another device which I rebuilt them in the studio, splitting up the image. So it's kind of looking and searching for different uses or, I don't know, questioning the whole setup. This is a close friend of mine from an artist group called General Idea. He's based here in Berlin. And at some point I noticed he's got this tattoo. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like a drawing. It's like the most uncommon tattoo. 
I've ever seen. And he said, yeah, it's, 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 it's a project of an artist friends of his and he wanted him to think of a tattoo that you don't think about it. You don't deliberately decide I'm gonna have this drawing or this or that. You just do it intuitively. So he hacked in this line and that was it. And I like this kind of a drawing. So in the typical manner, I started thinking of maybe an architecture. Um, I photographed the hat, like his hand, like the Pieta, this kind of gesture in Catholic religion in Italy. And we made these billboards. So it hits you out of the blue, it has no meaning. Um, and this kind of saving, kind of this, this pieta, kind of that gesture. But then I decided to take it further and actually film like another portrait of him. This is the setup in the studio. We got these tracks, big circular tracks. And again, here you see him in the middle. And this is camera one. And there's camera two. And then they can start rotating around him. This is what that looks like. It's a challenge if I look at the sculpture like an object. Or if I have a conversation with someone, I don't know what's happening at the back. There was this attempt to have this rotating movement to have a simultaneous vision at once. Okay. And this simultaneous moment is being projected then onto two screens. Having this pole where they're just leaning at each other. It's a very sad story. Um, a. Bronson is still alive and his two companions, they formed a general idea back in the 60s. And I mean, they have works as well in MoMA and, and all over. Um, two of them died from HIV in the beginning of the 90s. And A. Bronson is like the Salem survivor. Um, he's based now here in Berlin. Right now he's got a big retrospective in Canada, which is traveling to Amsterdam and then also coming to Berlin. So again, but it's capturing, you know, the presence of a person in space, just like through simultaneous cameras. And then here, like these are studies, this is shot from his eye. I did more of them. And I decided to start the cutout actually in the screen. So you have this blind spot or like a black spot. And when the projection hits, you can't really tell. Um, and it's this kind of void that goes through. This is in Italy where I had like two sets of these screens opposite. This is a still. So this cutout is kind of, I don't know, it's, well, you could regard it as, I don't know, like destruction or something, but I like the randomness and kind of where it would hit the image. And it's this kind of impossibility of me like to interfere or correct it or anything like that. I also tried it then as paintings where I did distract, um, took like stills from the video and I printed it out in paper, glued it on or printed canvases. Also took the screen tests of Andy Warhol, took like a book where I drilled through. So the cutout would hit randomly again on the page or would go through one of these stills.
This is John Journal, The Sleep. And this format is kind of, I take these canvases to the printer, I prime the canvas and they slide in the whole canvas and print the thing on. So I very, I think it's a kind of a new technique having to say that the galleries always demand stuff for repairs. And also like, if you look at the discourse at the moment of painting or figurative painting, it's everywhere. So during lockdown, I spent most of the time with a video artist. He's called Douglas Gordon. He's also based here in Berlin. Most of them maybe seen his show at MoMA, big reprospective video artist. And um, in the lockdown, I filmed a portrait of him. My idea is really like to have, I built this mobile here in the studio to have this rotation, what we had before, like with um, a Bronson where the cameras would rotate, I would have the projections rotating. So here you can see like a test shot. And what I did is I had him lying on the ground and I filled the two iPhones, his hands. And it's this uncontrolled choreography. Sometimes he would clap in the, in the air or the hands would reach over. And I like this moment where you bridge the body in place. He's tattooed all over. So when you have the insulation, I'll show you some insulation shots in a minute. The volume is very loud and it's very unpleasant and kind of to have this banging sound. Um, again, these are like drawings for the mobile, different collages. And this one here was most recent in Milano, where I showed this piece. But here you get an idea about, you know, the split of the fragmented body. And I deliberately used iPhones, I wanted something really cheap and kind of that everybody has a hand, not shooting it on 6K with red cam or something like that. No. So there's another installation shot from there. Here you see the hands reaching over. And um, this was the last work I've done. So the next step would be taking stills and really have them large in space printed out, um, not on canvas that I had before. And then starting like also like with architectural models. And again, the fragment of the body. But for the time being, I'm not sure what the next step will be. But I think I'll try these ones these very kind of stills and have them printed out in a very large scale and have them put up in the space. So that's it from my side. And I think we were kind of dashing through a lot of works from the last, I don't know, 20 years now. So yeah. Um, but I think you can see kind of the main concern is like the moving figure in space, using video as a tool, rearranging the figure in space, different experiments, found footage from the film director, the Italian film director, Michelangelo Antonioni, or looking out for portraits. They're all experiments. 
trying to arrange the figure in space. I don't know whether I succeed or not, but certainly the presence of, of the installations are extremely strong and, and they, they, they seem to work. And usually one thing leads to another. So this is also what I wanted to show you, starting off you know, with a mistake, shooting a video, um, and then starting working with dancers, first leg with sculptures, then shifting into video, working with Forsyth, again, the figure, the portrait. So, you know, once you start, you take off and things add up and one thing comes to another. So this is kind of what I wanted to share with you and I hope I didn't bombard you with too many images, you know? I, you can unmute, just ask a question if you want. Thank you so much, Peter. So we have one question in the chat right now. Uh, mm. This is from Lasha. She says, what is it about the movement of the body that you like or look for? Is it all movement? Oh. It's maybe something I don't understand and it's maybe something I find most fascinating. Um, I think it occurs from the choreography it occurs from sculpture. And if you look at sculpture like Rodin or whatever you want, figurative sculpture is always still. It's kind of not doing anything. And you saw the first pieces where I started to move the figure. Um, these are like the first attempts. I think it's a different discourse if you talk about the body. I mean, the body for me is um, Anna Medieta, for instance. It's a different discourse. I'm really talking about the figure here, right? And I think choreography also means like this ins inscribing something in space. And I mean, you can write your PhD just on the movement of, of Forsyth, for instance. It's unbelievable. Like this moment, like this alphabet they have, real-time choreography where they pick up elements it's very complex it would completely burst this but it's most stunning um it's hard for me to give you a proper answer i don't know it's maybe like some understanding i don't have myself that i'm trying to to figure out and that's maybe one of the reasons why i'm doing all these works simple as that can you unmute what is it i'm intrigued how you found let me see. Your project, advice how to navigate that. <laughs> no risk, no fun. <laughs> That's the one for sure. Um, it, it all sounds kind of, you know, yeah, and I did this and I did that and blah, blah, blah. No, there's a lot of um, doubt. Oh, hold on, I've got something for you. Let me share my screen. Hold on, I have it there for you. Can you read it? It's um, by Eva Hesse. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a beautiful film, a beautiful documentary, and I was so touched by it. I saw this uh, re-perspective in London, where they put out examples of the latex and the string, and you really could experience and the haptic and the feel, and you kind of really got an idea. And then I thought kind of, oh my God, you know, this is beyond. But it's a letter from Solovitz to Eva Hesse, which I have right there on the wall. I see it every day. I have all these doubts and questions myself. Yeah. Don't worry about cool. Make your own uncool. <laughs> Make your own your own world. You must practice being stupid, dumb, unthinking, empty. Then you will be able to do. I have much confidence in you, and even you though you're tormenting yourself, the work you do is very good. Try to do some bad work, the worst you can think of, and see what happens. But mainly relax and let everything go to hell. Is that an advice? <laughs> so, um, hard to say. It's just something that drives me, like for years and years. 
and um, making all this work is kind of just an attempt. And sometimes you stop and you put out wherever you've arrived and say, okay, this is what I'm going to show. Um, and then you just move on. And for some reason, something else comes up. Um, leading you to like another work and another one and another one. Yeah. Hold on, I'll make stop, share the screen. There we go. Yeah. So that's something I can advise you. Don't give up. And once you graduate, get your studio, um, you know, and continue working, working, working. How much of the dancers' movement is left to their own interpretation? Yeah. In fact, I set up the table, like the, the set up the prop for filming. And um, I pressed recording and I walked out the space because I thought um, it would feel really strange if I give directions to Foresight. The only thing I told him is like, I want you to inscribe the title whenever on, 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 know how on. And then we did different takes, um, five all together. And I didn't edit the takes, I just had them going from, you know, start to stop, that was it. In the five part installation, then I slowed it down to 50%. That was the only effect I used because in the slow motion, well, it creates total beauty, um, but at the same time, you, it's kind of more readable while you move through these screens, while you arrange, you know, um, this mosaic of movement, yeah. Um, I never go in front of the camera. You're lucky to see me now, but you will never ever <laughs> otherwise see me. I don't know, I can't do it. I don't want to, um, it's not my urge. Um, my interest really, like I said, is, is the moving figure in space. Um, and there's a lot more kind of, I think if, if you find, I don't know, like the curved wall of Casa Malaparte, I think that's, you know, that's also like something that touches me or that's part kind of where like I agree or see myself in it but it would never ever occur in my work. It just doesn't happen. I don't want that. No, not at all. In other words, capture your own movement in space. No, <laughs> sorry, no, no, not at all. No, but that's okay. Um, other like, you observe the figure in space, but not be the figure in space, yes. Absolutely. It's like hearing your own voice. Can't do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of elements where I find myself. I find music ever so often is like way more emotional or something like that, that art can be. Or I go around and see like a lot of exhibitions. I love the work by Bruce Nauman. I die for, for Samuel Beckett. Um, and then you find these people like on the way and you learn from them, you try. Like Samuel Beckett, he, he worked in theater. He eliminated the figure gradually, you know, waiting for Godot, there were the two. He introduced the loop, happy days. You had Winnie up to here. Then he did not die, where you just have the mouth, the source of language speaking in the dark. I mean, woof. he did quad for TV, a film for TV and then he did a radio piece where you sit in complete darkness where you just have the audio coming out of the dark. I mean, he completely elim eliminated the whole figure. It's gone, it's gone. And he's so pioneering and he did this back like when? In the forties and the fifties, holy moly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Questions. It's this embarrassing moment that everybody. <laughs> I think we have one more question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Have you seen the works from the 1960s by American contemporary dancers in which they, women, shaped paper with their bodies or did drawings limited by their reach as they stood on large paper? What are your thoughts on those works? 
I can't see the question. Is it in the chat? Yes, it is in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, yeah, the red one. Have you seen the works from 19... Oh, sorry. Stop. Sorry. Um, limited. Um, I, I was told there's works by Tricia Brown, I think. She also used charcoal. And I saw something on the internet as well. Yeah, they lay down on the ground and they make these, these big drawings. Um, there's a closeness to it, absolutely. But from the work I've did done with foresight, um, I don't know, I used something as a template and then I wanted like a different device, like the, like the drawing that he did with the lead attached to his feet and hands. Um, I liked them, but I preferred the ones where, where I actually did the drawing myself. So the works like that Trisha Brown did is, is, I don't know, you see her like on a paper and, and she would literally make a drawing, right? And I think the difference that I've done with the work with William Forsythe, he did this kind of drawing unawarely. It's something that occurred while he was doing the performance. So it's a side effect, so to speak, and it wasn't the focus of what we were doing. So our interest was like kind of to have the template and actually to inscribe the presence of absence. Is that a good way to put it? Something that's not there? To inscribe the presence of absence while trying to record, um, you know, the figure, yeah. So the figures aren't, um, they're not actually drawing anything. You're just drawing over the videos? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In the first piece, the whenever on, 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 now how on, I project the sequence onto the paper and then I was chasing the movement, yes. And by the retranslation of the Francis Bacon, I attached lead. Um, but while he was doing it, he was also erasing it at the same time with his clothes and everything. So we never used them. But as a process, it was interesting that he would unawarely create something or like make another drawing, you know, just in, in the sequence of it. Oh. Thank you so much, Peter. Do we have any last minute questions? <laughs> No, that's okay. <laughs> no, looks like not. Well, thank you so much. Okay. What a wonderful lecture. We were so glad to have you. And thank you for everyone who joined. Yeah, thanks for joining. You also find me on Instagram or in Berghain in Berlin when you come clubbing. <laughs> Reach out <laughs> and let me know. Yeah, um, maybe something else comes up you'd like to know. I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah, thanks a million, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Have you. Fun. All right. You take care and keep up the work. Keep on going, everyone. <laughs> Great. Thank Thanks you. All right. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.